Many interpreters have noted that although Paul's letters have a lot to say about Jesus as the resurrected Lord, they have precious little to say about him as a historical person. Unlike what we find in the Gospels, Paul's letters don't provide us with explicit references to Jesus' sermons or his teachings, they never recall any of his dialogues or disputes with others, and they don't provide us with stories about his healings, his exorcisms, or his miracles. And some have inferred from this lack of historical information that the apostle was just not very interested in the historical life of Jesus. The famous German scholar Rudolf Bultmann, for example, inferred as much from this text in 2 Corinthians 5.16. From now on, therefore, we know no one according to the flesh. Even if we have known Christ according to the flesh, we know him thus no longer. Scholars who take this view often argue that Paul's apparent lack of interest in the historical Jesus can be explained in terms of church politics. Paul, you see, was not one of Jesus' original twelve disciples, nor was he biologically related to Jesus, as others appear to have been. In fact, it may be the case that he never even met Jesus in the flesh. Hence, in order to talk about Jesus' life, Paul would have had to rely on the testimonies of others like Peter, James, and John. But by doing that, he would draw attention to the fact that he never knew Jesus in the flesh. This, in turn, would reveal his inferiority to the other early leaders in the church. So rather than do that, Paul simply chose not to say much about the historical Jesus in his letters. On this view, it could still be argued that Paul was privy to a large body of information about the historical Jesus. He simply chose not to talk about it. Others have argued that the reason Paul had so little to say about the historical Jesus was because there just wasn't much of a historical record about him. Bear in mind here that the Gospels are usually thought to have been written some 20 years or so after Paul's earliest letters had been written. The Gospel of Mark was perhaps written in the late 60s or early 70s, and then the other Gospels were written, usually it's thought that they were written in about the 80s or the 90s, or perhaps even later. So perhaps at the time when Paul was writing, Jesus was remembered generally as a wise Jewish teacher and a miracle worker who clashed with the religious leaders and was crucified as a result and subsequently rose from the dead. But there wasn't much else that anyone really knew about him or cared to know. Only later on would his followers start to invent stories about him in order to prove that he was the Messiah or that he was someone worth following. The Gospels were the first attempt to give anything resembling a biographical sketch of the life of Jesus. But these Gospels were written too late to be of any real historical value. More radical views about the historical Jesus have been advocated as well. Some have argued that Paul's lack of interest in the historical Jesus indicates that the Apostle didn't even regard Jesus as a historical person, that is, as someone who lived in our time and space. This view has really gained a lot of traction in recent decades. Some of the more notable proponents for this kind of approach have been Bruno Bauer in the 19th century and John M. Robertson in the 20th. And then in the last few decades, some of the more prominent advocates have been Earl Doherty, Robert Price, Richard Carrier, and Joseph Atwill. The internet has really allowed mythicist viewpoints to proliferate like never before. If you've spent any time on the internet researching stuff about Jesus or early Christianity, you will have almost certainly heard someone advocating for some kind of mythicist viewpoint. But it's important to realize that not all mythicists believe the same way. Many of them would not deny that there was once a man named Jesus. Rudolf Bultmann, for example, and even someone like G.A. Wells, who was more radical than even Bultmann, accepted that Jesus was a historical person. But they believe that the Jesus who is mediated to us through the New Testament Gospels has been so thoroughly mythologized that there's now virtually nothing that we can still know about him. Bultmann thought that the story of Jesus' incarnation, redemption, and ascension 
was patterned on a pre-Christian Gnostic Redeemer myth. But this whole idea about there being a pre-Christian Gnostic Redeemer myth is now generally rejected as a modern scholarly construct. In other words, it's not something that you find in any actual pre-Christian texts, but was something that was basically invented by modern scholars. The myth was constructed on the basis of many disparate texts that ranged widely in their dates and provenance. If you're interested, here's a very brief explanation as to why the Gnostic Redeemer myth is no longer thought to have influenced early Christian beliefs about Jesus. Okay, so, but now we've got these even more radical Jesus mythicists who claim that the original Jesus wasn't even a historical person, but only an angel or some kind of spiritual entity who was only later transformed into a historical person through a kind of reverse euhemerization process. Euhemerism, in case you don't know, is an ancient theory that the gods whom people worship were originally nothing more than deeply loved and admired human beings. Over time, the stories about these people grew more and more exaggerated, and eventually the exaggerations gave rise to marvelous tales, and the deeply loved and admired human beings came to be remembered not as mere human beings, but as gods. Many mythicists invert this theory by claiming that Jesus was originally a mythological figure who was later transformed into a historical figure. By the way, reverse euhemerization is my own terminology. Richard Carrier just calls this euhemerization, but I don't think he understands what the term means. He didn't fall? Inconceivable. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And so here are a few quotes from some prominent mythicists who take this approach. First from Robert Price. The epistles of Paul, earlier than the Gospels, do not evidence a recent historical Jesus. We should never guess from the epistles that Jesus died in any particular historical context, only that the fallen angels, the archons of this age, did him in, little realizing that they were sealing their own doom. And then from Earl Doherty, Paul's Christ Jesus was an entirely supernatural figure, crucified in the lower heavens at the hands of the demon spirits. And then from Richard Carrier, the only Jesus that Paul shows any knowledge of is a celestial being, not an earthly man. Paul's Jesus is only ever in the heavens. In this lecture, I'm going to focus most of my attention on the views of people like Price, Doherty, and Carrier. I think that there are a number of problems with their methodologies and their conclusions, and I hope to have demonstrated why I think that by the end of this lecture. But let me start off here at the outset by saying a little something about methodology. Jesus mythicists often have real difficulties handling the textual evidence with regard to the historical Jesus. Simply put, if any of the evidence doesn't fit their theory, they search for and seize upon any possible ways that they can to dismiss it, even if there are compelling reasons to take this evidence more seriously. For example, they conveniently dismiss as irrelevant all of the material from the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and other New Testament writings on the grounds that these books were written too late and therefore already represent what they call a historicizing approach to Jesus' life. So, with a simple wave of the hand, they tell us that all of this material is off-limits if we're trying to understand the origins of Christianity. Well, if you've done a bit of study on the various theories about how the Gospels were written, you'll know that many sayings and stories in the Gospels appear to have been in circulation prior to the time when the Gospels themselves were composed. So, whether someone believes that these traditions were contained in an early document like Q, or perhaps that they were circulating orally, it seems pretty obvious that Mark and the other Gospel writers were working with pre-existing traditions. And this really makes sense historically. I mean, it's hard to imagine Christianity even getting off the ground if for the first 30 or 40 years, 
There weren't any recorded memories about Jesus for people to latch on to. Imagine the earliest followers of Jesus trying to convince others that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, without having any stories about his life, without having any of his teachings, without having anything really to say about him. How would Christianity have had any appeal? Well, this question has posed a major difficulty for mythicists of the past, but more recent and more radical mythicists, like Doherty, Price, and Carrier, claim to have an answer. They say that Christianity began as a mystery cult and was therefore able to appeal to people's religious needs, even if its central figure was purely mythological. We'll see in a bit, however, why it's problematic, I think, to see Christianity as a mystery cult. Okay, and also problematic from a methodological standpoint are the apparent ad hoc interpretations that mythicists often propose when dealing with certain texts that don't seem to comport with their theories. In order to salvage their theories, they often have to give these texts some very strained and unnatural interpretations. Or, alternatively, they'll simply dismiss these texts as interpolations, even despite what often seem like compelling reasons for thinking that these texts are in fact original. Their approaches to Galatians 4.4 and Romans 1.3, for example, are excellent cases in point of what I'm talking about here. And we'll talk more about those texts in part two of this lecture. Mythicists also resort quite a bit to arguments from silence. They suggest, for example, that if Paul doesn't mention any stories about Jesus' healings or exorcisms, then no such stories must have been known at the time. But this approach is logically flawed, as all arguments from silence are. It also doesn't take into account the fact that Paul's letters were occasionally motivated. Paul, you see, was dealing with specific issues that had arisen in the churches where he had ministered, or hoped to minister. He presumably didn't think that his readers still needed to be educated about the details of Jesus' life. Mythicists will also engage in some rather imaginative theorizing in order to account for the origins of Christianity. To do this, they'll often appeal to obscure or idiosyncratic texts, or texts from a much later period, or writings which did not obviously play a factor in influencing early Christianity, and then they assume, with virtually no evidence, that these texts are extremely relevant for our understanding of the origins of Christianity. We'll look, for example, at how Richard Carrier appeals to certain texts in Philo, the Zohar, and the Ascension of Isaiah in order to advance his theory that the original Jesus was crucified by demons in outer space. Lastly, mythicists often have a very strange way of weighting the evidence. Not to keep picking on Carrier, but he notes that in the Babylonian Talmud, Jesus is said to have been alive in the days of King Alexander Janius, who died in 76 BC. And from this passage in the Babylonian Talmud, remember this is something that was probably codified in about AD 500, from this evidence, Carrier infers the existence of an early group of Christians living in Babylon who believed that Jesus lived during the reign of Alexander Janius. That's some pretty weak evidence, if you ask me. And I think it's quite clear that the only reason Carrier puts any weight in this evidence is because it fits with his argument about Jesus originally being a timeless, mythological figure. And this reveals that he's dealing with the evidence very tendentiously. Okay, so let me begin by trying to address this question of whether Christianity originated as a mystery cult. This is a very central claim of many recent mythicists. I plan to do a later video that gets into more of the details about mystery cults, but for now, suffice it to make just a few brief points. Regrettably, there's a lot that we don't know about these cults because they were quite secretive. But there's a decent amount that we do know, and I think it's enough to demonstrate that Christianity did not start off as a mystery cult. The Greek term for mystery was mysterion, 
And this noun comes from the verb mueo, which means initiate. Many philologists relate this verb to another verb, muo, which means to close, to shut the eyes. This suggests the idea of something being of a concealed or hidden nature. Okay, and I find this etymology quite convincing because it fits with one of the central ideas of the mystery cults, the idea of concealment or hiddenness. Now, over time, especially in later Christianity of the medieval period and beyond, the term mysterion took on other connotations. In particular, it was used to speak about things that seemed perplexing and inexplicable. The Eucharist, for example, was said to be a mystery because it was very hard to explain how something that looked and tasted like bread could in fact be the fleshly body of Jesus. But originally, that's not really how the term mysterion was used. As I said, it had more to do with the idea of concealment or hiddenness. The mystery cults were what we would now call occult groups. The Latin term occultus means hidden or secretive. And hidden or secretive knowledge was the central feature of these Greek and Roman mystery cults. Each cult offered to its initiates a secret knowledge about the gods or about life or death or about something else. The initiate had to swear never to divulge this knowledge to anyone else, or at least not to anyone who had not yet been initiated. Mystery cults were quite popular by the turn of the era. There was a mystery cult dedicated to the goddess Demeter and Persephone, and others dedicated to the god Dionysus. But foreign mystery cults were quite popular as well. In fact, Dionysus himself was originally a foreign deity. There was a mystery cult devoted to the Phrygian goddess Sibylle, also known as the Great Mother, and her young lover Attis. There was another mystery cult dedicated to the Persian god Mithra. And there was a mystery cult dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis, which was extremely popular among the Romans. Most of the gods and goddesses in these mystery cults were of a chthonic variety. In other words, they were closely associated with the earth or the underworld. They weren't heavenly deities. Persephone, for example, was the queen of Hades. Her mother Demeter was an Olympian goddess who abandoned her heavenly abode in order to search for her daughter. She, her daughter, and Attis were all closely associated with the earth and the agrarian cycles. Isis was the wife and sister of Osiris, the Egyptian god of the underworld. Even Dionysus, who is sometimes counted among the Olympian gods, was really the god of viticulture and was therefore closely associated with the earth. His mother was a mortal, and he originally didn't even have a home on Mount Olympus. Indeed, the Greek historian Herodotus identifies him with Osiris, the Egyptian god of the underworld. Okay, so why do some scholars, not just mythicists by the way, claim that Christianity was originally a mystery cult? Well, for starters, from the early centuries, Christians began referring to baptism and the Lord's Supper as mysteries. Christians also referred to the baptized as initiates, mustai, and they referred to those who had received the mysteries as the perfect, telatai. These were all key terms within the mystery cults. So the very terms that were used in early Christianity would suggest that it was a mystery cult. There are also many parallels between Christianity and the mystery cults in terms of their practices, beliefs, and ideas. Mystery cults often required ritual cleansings, for example, and so you can compare that with baptism. Mystery cults often had shared meals, so you can compare the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Mystery cults spoke of being born again, so recall that passage in John chapter 3, verse 3, where Jesus says that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Mystery cults were concerned with personal salvation, especially salvation after death. Mystery cults generally centered on a god or goddess who suffered and or died, 
but then recovered. For example, in the story of Osiris, that's Isis's brother slash husband, Set kills and dismembers Osiris, scattering his body parts throughout Egypt. Isis then collects all these body parts and puts them back together. This allows Osiris's body to regain some of its former virility, allowing Isis, in turn, to copulate with it and conceive Horus. Dionysus, as a young baby, is eaten by the Titans. His heart, however, is rescued, and so his father Zeus implants it into a woman named Semele, and she eventually gives birth to the babe. Attis goes insane, emasculates himself, and dies after his mother and lover, Sibylle, finds out that he's getting married behind her back, and bursts into the wedding ceremony in a fit of jealous rage. Persephone is kidnapped by Hades and dragged into the underworld while her mother pines away in sorrow over her missing daughter. Eventually, Persephone is allowed to depart from Hades, at least for a part of the year, so long as she returns for the other part. And so, with each of these myths, you might compare the story about Jesus' passion and resurrection. And then lastly, even early Christian apologists recognized that their beliefs and practices had striking analogs in the pagan mystery cults. Okay, so you can see that it's not entirely without warrant that some people think that Christianity began as a mystery cult. But now I want to offer some counter-arguments to those points. First of all, unlike mystery cults, Christianity was quite exclusivistic. It didn't accept the validity of the other mystery cults. To be a Christian, one had to renounce all other religious ties. And this made it very different, I think, from the mystery cults, where a person would often go from one mystery cult to another, and there was no requirement that the person, after being initiated into the mysteries of Dionysus, for example, had to renounce Dionysus in order to be initiated into the mysteries of Isis. The philosopher Pythagoras, for example, whom many would have seen as an exemplar for their own philosophical and religious pursuits, was said to have been initiated into the mysteries at Byblos, Tyre, and Syria. Okay, and second, although Christians from perhaps the last quarter of the second century and beyond began referring to baptism and the Eucharist as mysteries, the New Testament authors themselves, as well as the so-called apostolic fathers, do not. And if you look at how Paul, the apostle, uses the word mystery in the New Testament, he uses it about some kind of hidden revelation that God has only recently revealed to the church. He never uses the term with respect to baptism or the Lord's Supper. Also, if you notice, for him, the mysteries are not to be kept hidden. If they are hidden, it's only because those listening are blinded by their sin. It's not because Paul or anyone else was purposely withholding information from them because they hadn't been initiated or fully initiated or whatever. In fact, he divulges several mysteries in his letters. So this shows that he wasn't particularly concerned with keeping the mysteries secret. It also clues us in on what sorts of things he's talking about when he uses the term mystery. He mentions the mystery of how the Jews had been hardened for a season, the mystery of how the Gentiles would be incorporated into God's people, the mystery of how the Messiah would be crucified to ensure our glorification, something that the rulers of this world failed to understand, he talks about the mystery of how our bodies will be changed into incorruptible bodies, and so on. These mysteries may have once been hidden, but now they've been revealed, and it was now his task to make them fully known to the nations. This understanding was really at the heart of Paul's missionary pursuits. The apostle believed that what God had revealed was now to be publicly proclaimed. This is all very different from how things were done in the mystery cults. Those who were initiated into the mystery cults didn't go out and proclaim their mysteries. They had to swear never to divulge them 
Paul no doubt appropriated some of the language of the mystery cults in his epistles, but this is because that language was so much in the air, so to speak, and especially because it was the language that his readers, the Corinthians especially, would have used and related to. But Paul's use of the word mystery and his references to certain things that he says were once concealed have more to do with Jewish apocalypticism, I think, than the mystery cults. Okay, and then third, Christian baptism was derived from John the Baptist, a well-known historical figure. He may have gotten the idea from biblical texts that speak of an eschatological washing, or he may have gotten the idea from Jewish ritual ablutions, which I discussed in my lecture on the Council of Jerusalem. Or he may have gotten the idea from Jewish proselyte baptisms, which I also discussed in the same lecture. There's no reason, therefore, to assume that this practice of early Christians was inspired by or borrowed from the Greco-Roman mystery cults. Indeed, ritual ablutions are a feature of many ancient religions, so the mystery cults aren't even distinctive in this respect. Fourth, the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, at least in the Gospels, and Paul may share some awareness of this too, was instituted as a kind of add-on to the Jewish Passover meal. And when he was instituting it, Jesus invoked many Old Testament phrases and motifs. So just as with Christian baptism, the Lord's Supper can be adequately explained without any reference to the mystery cults. And then lastly, Christianity was not a secretive religion. The New Testament authors portrayed John the Baptist, the apostles, and the early Christians as conducting baptism and the Lord's Supper in public for all to see. And even Justin Martyr in the latter half of the second century seems to have felt no restraint about divulging to his pagan audience all the goings on in a Christian worship service. There was evidently no sunthema, a secret password, that a person needed to know in order to participate in these services. Now, this would change in later centuries when the tradition was introduced of dismissing all the unbaptized or the non-initiated before the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But this isn't how things were at the beginning. The Apostle Paul encouraged the Christians at Corinth to maintain better order in their services precisely because he knew that common folks and unbelievers sometimes attended. Justin Martyr, who went into quite a bit of detail about Christian worship services, also mentions nothing about a dismissal of the uninitiated. Okay, but what about the early Christian apologists like Justin, Tertullian, Arnobius, and Firmicus Maternus, who themselves fully acknowledged and even drew attention to certain parallels between Christianity and the mystery cults, or pagan religion generally? Well, I think that it's important to note why they did this. They did it in order to show two things. First, that it is fundamentally unfair for Christians to be persecuted. Since there are other people in society who believe in things that are not far removed from what Christians believe, it's hypocritical and unjust to single out Christians for persecution and not to persecute these other people. You can see Justin making this kind of argument in this excerpt from his first apology. And then the second reason that these early Christian apologists tried to identify and even draw attention to any parallels between Christianity and pagan religions is because they wanted to corroborate their theory about how demons have tried to mimic Christianity. You see, they argued that since these demons knew the prophecies of Scripture, they inspired pagans to introduce myths about their gods undergoing suffering and death, and they inspired pagans to adopt rituals and other practices that Christians would later adopt. The demons did this, these early Christian apologists alleged, in order to discredit Christianity before it even got started. Now, most Christians today would find this whole line of reasoning quite silly and unconvincing, but I think it's important to appreciate what the early Christian apologists were doing, rhetorically speaking, whenever they acknowledged parallels between Christianity and the mystery cults, 
or between Christianity and the pagan religions more generally. And feel free to pause the video here and read these excerpts from Justin and Firmicus Maternus. Okay, so with these two goals in mind, early Christian apologists actively sought out parallels between Christianity and pagan religions. From their perspective, every parallel that they could identify served as further confirmation for their claims about being unfairly treated or about demons mimicking Christianity. And so what we encounter in many of the early Christian apologists is a kind of parallelomania, that is, a distorted exaggeration about the number and the extent of parallels between Christianity and pagan religions. For example, when Justin speaks here about those in the cult of Mithra participating in a copycat Eucharist, I think he's exaggerating the parallels between the Mithraic cult and Christianity. After all, many, if not most, religious cults in the ancient world would have had some kind of communal meal in their liturgies. Now, it's true that some of the mystery cults featured myths about someone, usually a god, suffering and then being restored to life or health, and many have found these myths curiously reminiscent of the story about Jesus' death and resurrection. But I think there are many dissimilarities that ought to be mentioned as well. Persephone, for example, descends to the underworld but doesn't actually die there, nor is she raised from the dead. It's mostly her mother, Demeter, that suffers, and she does so emotionally because her daughter has been abducted. Attis dies, but he's not resurrected. Only his little finger is allowed to live. And it's his lover Sibylle who really is the one who suffers, once again emotionally, because of this. It's true that Firmicus Maternus speaks of Attis being brought back to life, but this seems to be another example of parallelomania. No other author uses this kind of language. Dionysus Zagreus doesn't seem to die either because his heart is kept alive. He's not raised from the dead, therefore. Instead, his heart is implanted into the womb of a mortal named Semele and allowed to develop once again as a fetus in the womb. He's then born a second time and becomes known as the twice-born god. The Zagreus myth has other variations, but this seems to have been the main one. It was by no means the only myth that was told about Dionysus' birth. The Zagreus myth was popular among the Orphics, but it was certainly not the most well-known version of the birth of Dionysus. In the most well-known version, Zeus was said to have had his affair not with Persephone, but with Semele. Then, when Semele was pregnant, she made Zeus reveal to her his true form. Unable to abide his glory, Semele was then incinerated. Zeus, however, prevented Dionysus from being totally consumed by snatching the six-month-old fetus from Semele's burning body and then implanting it into his own thigh. So then a few months later, Dionysus was born from his own father's body. And this is how he became known as the twice-born god. As in the Zagreus myth, so in this one, Dionysus doesn't die but is saved from death. Thus, when Firmicus Maternus speaks of him being killed, he seems to be projecting the story of Jesus onto the myth, not representing the myth accurately. Likewise, when Justin speaks of the god being torn in pieces and ascending into heaven, he is artificially sequencing two unrelated events in order to make the god Dionysus sound more like a demonically inspired imitation of Christ. Okay, and then what about Osiris? Osiris is slain and his wife slash sister Isis suffers emotionally as a result. Although she reconstitutes Osiris's body and successfully procreates with his corpse, Osiris himself never rises from the dead. He lives on only in two senses. First, as the ruler of the underworld. Second, through the legacy of Horus, his son and successor to the throne. Contrary to what is often claimed, 
the Egyptians did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And so, because of these and other dissimilarities between these various myths, many in the field of religious studies have argued that there really never was a unified and widely recognized dying and rising gods concept in the ancient world. Hence, those who attempt to understand Christianity in light of this concept are looking at Christianity through the lens of an artificial and entirely modern scholarly construct. Others have pointed out, with regard to the mystery cults, that the suffering or death of the gods was generally explained as a metaphor for the vegetation cycles. In one part of the year, the vegetation dies. In another part, it comes alive again. Or alternatively, Egyptian mythology was interpreted as a metaphor for the solar cycle. Osiris dies, but his wife Isis has sex with his corpse and becomes pregnant with Horus. Horus then defeats Set and reclaims the throne of his father. This was all understood as a metaphor or an archetype for the sun in its various positions. In the evening, it descends into the underworld, the realm of the dead, but in the morning, it reemerges into the land of the living. So here again, the mystery cults seem quite different from Christianity. Christianity didn't come up with its idea about Jesus' death and resurrection by contemplating the agrarian cycle or the solar cycle. His death, at least, seems entirely plausible from a historical standpoint. I mean, there's nothing implausible about a Jew of the first century claiming to be the Messiah, or having followers who at least regarded him as the Messiah. Josephus tells us that there were a number of these sorts of figures in the first century. There was Judah of Galilee, a Samaritan prophet, John the Baptist, Theudas, an Egyptian prophet, an unnamed impostor, Simon of Perea, Athronges, Menachem, and many others. We also know about the famous messianic figure of Simon bar Kokhva of the second century. In almost every case, these messianic figures and their movements were violently suppressed by the Romans. That's because everyone who attracted a following by claiming to be the Messiah, or some other kind of Messiah-like figure, was seen as a threat to the established order, and therefore a threat to the Roman state. We also know that for the Romans of the first century, crucifixion was a favorite form of execution. Many Jews in Palestine were sentenced to death by crucifixion. So the story of Jesus' crucifixion is, again, entirely plausible from a historical standpoint, especially if he was regarded by his followers as the promised Messiah. Moreover, there were several biblical texts which seemed to speak about the Messiah dying. Daniel 9.26, for example, talks about how an anointed figure will be cut off and that this will be followed by the city and temple being destroyed. Isaiah 53 also, which I talked about in my earlier lecture about Jewish expectations of coming redemption, seemed to speak about the Messiah dying for the sins of his people. So at least this much of the story of Jesus makes perfectly good sense from a historical standpoint. A man named Jesus, or Joshua in Hebrew, an extremely popular name in first century Judaism, claimed to be the Messiah, gaining a following, and was crucified by the Roman authorities as a consequence. There's no reason to think that, thus far at least, we are dealing with some kind of mythological story. But what about Jesus' resurrection? Surely this part of the story can't be regarded as historical, or can it? Well, it depends on what you mean. I believe that Jesus' resurrection is something that must ultimately be accepted on the basis of faith, not historical argumentation. But this doesn't mean that the idea had no connection to Jewish history and culture, such that it had to be derived from another culture. First of all, the Jewish scriptures and intertestamental literature indicate that a belief in the bodily resurrection was embraced by many Jews long before the time of Jesus. Just how much earlier is a matter of debate, but the belief certainly predated Christianity. To be sure, the resurrection was expected to involve all the dead, or at least all the righteous Jews. It was also expected to occur at the end of the age, 
It was not expected to involve only the Messiah or to occur before the end of the age. In these respects, the resurrection of Jesus was distinctive and would have presumably been quite unexpected, at least by most Jews of the day. But early Christians, including Paul, never appealed to the mystery cults for their explanation of Jesus' individual resurrection. Instead, they claimed that this is something that had been foretold in Scripture. I'll mention here just a few of the biblical texts that early Christians seem to have interpreted as prophecies about Jesus' resurrection. Psalm 16 is cited twice in the book of Acts, and note the logic. David, the psalmist, said that God would not leave his soul in Hades, nor allow his Holy One to see corruption. Given the fact that David died and his tomb was well known, it follows that he was speaking prophetically about someone else, namely the Messiah. Early Christians may have also inferred from these texts that the Messiah's resurrection had been foretold in Scripture. All of these texts were understood by Jews of the first century as prophecies about the Messiah. But notice the language. We're told over and over that this figure will arise, or that God will raise him up. In Hebrew, the verbal root kum, which is used in these texts, is also used to speak about the resurrection, as in Psalm 88.10, Isaiah 26.19, and Hosea 6.2 texts that have been traditionally understood within Judaism to speak about the general resurrection. Likewise, in Greek, the verb anistemi, which the Septuagint translator uses in these texts to render the Hebrew word kum, is used to speak about the resurrection. And so you can hopefully appreciate how these prophecies about God raising up a prophet like Moses and a king like David could have been easily read by early Christians as prophecies about the Messiah's resurrection. In my lecture on the Jerusalem Council, I also noted the very interesting text in 4Q Florilegium, which interprets Amos 9.11 as a reference to the Messiah. In that biblical text, we're told that God will, quote, raise up the tent of David, which has, quote, fallen. And the author of 4Q Florilegium interprets this fallen tent as the Messiah whom God will raise up. So one can't help but wonder what he was thinking about when he wrote that. Aside from any other texts that might have been interpreted as prophecies about the Messiah's resurrection, early Christians also thought that this miraculous event had been sort of proleptically represented in several biblical stories and figures. For example, in the story about the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22, in this story, Abraham is told to sacrifice his own beloved son as a burnt offering to the Lord. And if you know the story, he's about to bring down the knife when an angel stays his hand. And then God tells him that he doesn't have to sacrifice his son after all, but that he should sacrifice a ram in his place. So it's as if Abraham receives his son back from the dead. Similarly, in the story of Jacob and Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 through 50, Jacob is told that his son Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. So when he gets the news several years later that his beloved son was still alive, it's as if his son had been raised from the dead. And in the Jewish Bible, there are many other instances of a beloved son either dying or coming very close to dying, but then somehow being restored to his father, or in one case, his mother. An excellent book that documents this motif is this one by John Levinson, The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son. I think it provides a much better cultural framework for understanding the death and resurrection of Christ than the myths of the so-called dying and rising gods. Okay, and then the figure of David may have also been interpreted as a type of the resurrected Messiah, a kind of foreshadowing, if you will. The Messiah was, of course, expected to be a son of David, and in some texts, at least according to Jewish and Christian interpreters from around the turn of the era, the Messiah could even be referred to as David. So it's notable in the Psalms, which were generally attributed to David, that the psalmist talks about crying out to God from Sheol, 
or from death or from the pit, and that he pleads for God to restore him back to life or rejoices that God has restored him back to life. Okay, and the story of the prophet Jonah being swallowed by the great fish and then re-emerging three days later was interpreted by early Christians as another type of Christ's resurrection. And early Christians may have also interpreted Isaiah 53 as containing a prophecy about Christ's resurrection. This chapter is usually recalled for its explicit mention of the servant dying for the sins of God's people. But it also seems to imply that the servant will live again, even after his death, as you can see from the verses that I've colored here in green. Now, your Bible translation may read something a bit different here. The phrase, he shall see light, follows the Septuagint and several manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's undoubtedly the original reading. And since light is often used in scripture as a metaphor for life, this phrase may have been read by early Christians as implying that the servant would be resurrected. Okay, so let me try to summarize what I've been saying here. Messianic expectations were high in first century Judaism. So there's nothing historically implausible about a man from Galilee claiming to be the Messiah or attracting followers who believed him to be the Messiah. Nor is there anything historically implausible about Jesus being crucified. Crucifixion was a commonly used form of execution, and the Romans would have regarded any messianic claimant as a political threat that needed to be suppressed or eliminated. Furthermore, the Jewish scriptures seem to speak about the Messiah both dying and being resurrected. Thus, by restricting ourselves only to what we know about the Judaism of Jesus' day, that is, only to Jewish sources and the things that we know or may reasonably infer about the Jewish beliefs and practices that had obtained by the first century, we seem to have found all the raw materials that we need in order to account for the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so there's simply no need to account for the story by appealing to some supposedly unified concept about dying and rising gods that was familiar to peoples of other cultures. I think that those who attempt to explain the story of Jesus' death and resurrection in light of this dying and rising God's concept are missing the story's immediate and much more obvious historical, cultural, and theological background. And here I think we can offer another criticism about the methodology that mythicists are prone to use in their theorizing. A good general rule when doing comparative studies on any religion, whether it be Christianity or anything else, is first to examine the cultural and philosophical milieu within which that religion emerged or developed. Only if this milieu proves inadequate should we take seriously the possibility of outside influences. We know that Christianity emerged within a Second Temple Jewish milieu, so it's prima facie reasonable to expect most of its influences to have come from there. Not surprisingly, we have found that the story of Jesus' death and resurrection is completely explicable within the context of Second Temple Judaism. It seems unnecessary, therefore, less parsimonious and even precarious, methodologically speaking, to search for another explication by appealing to a foreign religious concept one which, in the end, may be little more than a modern scholarly construct and not a unified and widely recognizable concept in the ancient world. Kind of like the Gnostic Redeemer myth that we talked about earlier. As we've seen, Jesus' mythicists argue that the historical narrative about Jesus that we find in the New Testament Gospels reflects a later development. And some go so far as to argue that Jesus was a purely mythological figure with no basis in historical reality. Richard Carrier, for example, argues that the earliest Christians believed that Jesus had been crucified by demons in the heavens, not on the earth. This understanding of Christian origins would certainly fit better with mythicist claims about the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus being just another iteration of the dying and rising gods concept. 
I mean, if that's really how the story of Jesus' death and resurrection was concocted, then it would be hard to believe that Jesus had even been a historical figure, or at least a historical figure who had been crucified under Pontius Pilate and was roughly contemporary with the Apostle Paul. Because that would mean that a historical figure of the very recent past had almost immediately been re-envisaged as a dying and rising god. But then, within only a few years, this mythological Jesus was discarded, and he was once again re-envisaged as a historical figure. It would be much more parsimonious simply to argue that there was no historical person to begin with. Jesus was envisaged from the beginning as a mythological figure, but was subsequently re-envisaged as a historical figure. Okay, well, although this understanding of the origins of the Jesus story may fit better with mythicist claims, I don't think it fits well with the evidence. And that's because if we look at the earliest writings of Christianity, namely the Pauline epistles, we find that Jesus was already envisaged as a historical figure. Of course, mythicists interpret this evidence differently, and so that's something I'd like to consider in the next lecture.